Hey, good morning, church family. Thanks for tuning in this morning to another week at Church at Home. Um, I just want to read a passage for you before we jump into worship. And so it comes from Psalms 95, and it, and it says this. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. And then verse 6 says, O come, let us worship, and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you, um, just eager to meet you, eager to encounter our King. And so Jesus, we just ask as we sing, as we worship, that your presence would come. Would you dwell in our midst? God, we ask that the songs and the words that come across our lips, that they would just be glorifying to you. So Jesus, Jesus, we give it to you. We honor you in your mighty name. Amen. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar when the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one? Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost begin to sing of Jesus Christ, the Saving One. Now we can see that God, you're moving a mighty river through the nations. When young and old will turn to Jesus. Me wide, you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Sing, open up and open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing And songs that bring your hope And songs that bring your joy And dancers who dance upon injustice Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost begin to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. Sing this out, we can see. Yeah, we can see that God who moving. A mighty river through the nations When young and old return to Jesus Flee wide you heavenly gates Prepare the way of the risen Lord Oh, sing open up And open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring, songs that bring your hope and songs that bring your joy. Dancers who dance. Upon injustice Let's sing this out, did you feel? 
Did you feel the darkness tremble when all these saints join in one song? And all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness. We're going to sing that again. Did you feel the darkness tremble when all these saints join in one song and all the streams flow as one river to wash away our brokenness? Yeah, we can see, now we can see that God here moving a time of jubilee is coming when young and old will turn to Jesus Flee wide you heavenly gates Prepare the way of the risen Lord Last time Open up And open up the doors And let the mute claim let the streets resound with singing in songs that bring your hope in songs that bring your joy dancers to dance upon injustice And with a thousand tongues to lift one cry and From north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified And were the whole earth Echoing his imminence And his name would burst from sea and sky From rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified Christ be magnified, just let his praise arise. Oh, Christ be magnified in me. And oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Oh, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ, be magnified Oh, be magnified, oh singing oh Christ be magnified just let his praise arise oh Christ be magnified in me singing oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life oh Christ be magnified in me I won't bow to 
idols I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true Cause if the cross brings transformation You can hang me there with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection life And if I join you in the sufferings Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels in the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same Singing oh, Christ be magnified Just let His praise arise Oh, Christ be magnified in me Singing oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Oh, Christ be magnified in me Singing oh, Christ be magnified Just let His praise arise Oh, Christ be magnified in me Singing oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me. You are the of it all. You were the of it all. And for from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory You are worthy of it all You are worthy of it all For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory Singing, oh, 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 and all the saints and angels they bow before your throne and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and they sing you're worthy of it all yeah. Worthy of it all For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory Night and day, let incense arise. 
day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, you are worthy. You are worthy of it all. Yeah, you are worthy of it all. All that we have, for from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. from you are all things to you are all things you deserve the glory yeah I exalt thee yeah I exalt thee yeah I Father, we lift you up. God, we just give you the glory. We're just madly in love with you. The way that you graciously walk with us through this life and the way that you provide and you protect and you watch over us. We're so grateful. We're so grateful that we serve a God who is so good, who's so kind. So Jesus, we just lift up your name today. In your mighty name, amen. Hey, good morning. What's up, church at home, family, church family. Just want to let you know, if you're still watching this home and unable to make it back in the building, uh, we miss you. We're still thinking about you. We've had some emails figuring out how we can maybe better connect some of you who haven't been back in the building yet, especially for some of our older demographic. I think of you guys frequently and just how much we miss you and how much we can't wait to see you again. Um, and, and so just know we're, we, are, we are looking at and trying to find some solutions about how we can maybe set up some call trees or something where we just get in touch with, with you more frequently because we miss you. We miss seeing you. We miss seeing you in the building. Uh, for those of us who have been back in the building, uh, I think things have been good. We've had a lot of fun times. We had a, a great all-in Sunday last Sunday, and we're looking forward just with a hopeful uh, anticipation for what might happen in the fall. And so just wanted to let you know before we dive into the sermon today that we are thinking about you guys. We miss you guys. We're bringing back our Next Steps classes this week. Uh, we, are, we are kicking off groups uh, in the next couple weeks. And so just be staying in tune. We, we definitely want to be a church that is not just uh, all about what happens on Sunday or all about what happens even just necessarily in the building, but we want to be a family that's connected with one another. And so we are working and trying to problem solve and figure things out in this unique season that we all find ourselves in. So with that, uh, I want to dive into the message today. really want to dive into a new series that we're going to be kicking off for the month of September. And this series is going to be called Create. And it's going to be a series on God's creativity and, and his creativity that he's given to us and how now we're going to steward that to, for his glory and for the, for the beautification, if you would, of our world. And when I've, what I've noticed is as I've been telling people that I'm or starting a series on creativity in, in the month of September, people go, oh, Okay, like, great. You know, there's, there's not a lot of excitement behind it. And I was wondering why that is. Uh, I, I myself, I don't really find myself to be that creative of a person, first of all. And so uh, when I, I kind of felt the stirring to do a series like this and to look at some of these creative themes in Scripture, I kind of went, man, you know what? I can draw, I can draw a pretty good stick figure 
but that's about all I got. Like every now and then in, in like my chemistry class in college, because I didn't really understand what was going on anyways, I would, I'd create the little scene where you'd flip through a packet of sticky notes or paper and the stick man would then actually like run across. It's not important. Never mind. Uh, but I'm not that creative of an individual. It's what, what I've always told myself. And I think I've, I've realized that really as, as, a, as a people right now, what we do is we say, well, there are creative people they're creatives. And then there's kind of the rest of us that we don't really see ourselves as creative. We, we, we delineate things into being either this right-brained or left-brained conversation. And so before I even really got into building out this series, I just wanted to look at the themes of Scripture to see, okay, wait, what does God actually say about creativity? Because he is the author and perfecter. He is the creator of all things. Obviously, he's a great storyteller. There's so many beautiful things that he's made. And so God is created. And he, we, have, we were created then in his image. And so what, is that, what does that do? And what does that mean for the world that we find ourselves in? And that's what I hope we will seek to answer in this series as we go. Um, I think it's, it, it's, it really would fail us to just reduce the conversation down to be this, uh, you're either this left brain uh, kind of like rigid, organized, uh, you like data, you like, you like facts, and you're not really influenced by emotions, or you're kind of this right-brained, you know, more free-spirited, creative, can think, and can be open about things. Really, maybe you, you let your feelings drive things more often. These are the stereotypes we build out. But really what we'll see this morning in scripture as we open up into Genesis chapter 1 is, is that God has not just even made Christians to be creative, but God has made people, he's made humankind to be these creative beings that now occupy the earth that he lives in. So um, I want to open right up to Genesis chapter 1 and look at the very first words in your Bible, the very first chapter, first verse of Genesis, which is the first book in your Bible. And it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and so this is, this is a mode of speech, a figure of speech called mirism. And so what God's saying when he says, um, I created the heavens and the earth, it doesn't mean that he just started with the heavens, stopped with the earth, and that was it. That was all he made. Mirism is, is using two kind of counter things to explain the whole. And, and so you think of this when we say like, oh, I searched high and low for those cookies in the kitchen. And and that doesn't mean that I searched on the top shelf and then I searched on the bottom shelf and, and then I explored nothing in between. What mirrors them, what you do when you're saying I searched high and low is it means I searched high, I searched low, I searched everywhere for those cookies and I couldn't find them anywhere. Uh, when we say our vows at a wedding, we say, I'm gonna love you for better or for worse, in rich and for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. It doesn't mean that we're vowing our love to our spouse in these only like polar extreme circumstances, like whether we have all the money in the world or none of the money in the world, I'll love you. But anywhere in between, I'm not going to love you. Uh, no, the vow means when we're using that figure of speech, it means I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you in whether you're at your sickest or at your healthiest. In all of these circumstances, I'm going to give you all of my love. And that's what God is saying here in Genesis chapter one. He's saying, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth and I created everything that is in between. And throughout the next 25 verses, then we get this look at just how creative our God is. He starts speaking, he opens his mouth and he creates the light and he creates the waters and he creates uh, the land to separate the waters. And he creates all this vegetation and all the, all the, the sea would be teeming with life that he's created. Now think of all the just insane creatures that he's made. It's almost as if God is superfluous in his creativity. It's almost like he's creating beyond what is actually necessary. Have you ever thought that way before? Like, like God didn't have to create color. And yet we live in this world that's so vibrant and so full of color, except for right now when everything's so smoky, you can barely even see anything. But, but there was a day, there will be a day again, when you can see the crisp winter morning on the Rocky Mountains. And he didn't have to make it look that way, but God is clearly uh, careful, mindful of beauty. And as he's arranging all the vegetation, I think of all the vast forests and what that would look like. And I think of, I think of the cliffs of Moor as he's creating these just beautiful landscapes that would hold in the sea, as he would say. And, and I just, you can be awestruck, caught up in Romans 1 shows us that, man, you know what? The glory of the Lord has been short, shown to all mankind just by the world that we live in. And just the, just like, we're all going to be held accountable just because you look around and you see the evidence of this perfect creative being. And I even thought this week, it even goes a step further than just to assume and, and to like think of how he thought he created everything. Um, 
he actually, as he's creating everything, he creates the systems that then sustain everything too. So, so he didn't just open his mouth and speak out the universe. He opened his mouth, spoke out the universe, and he set all the stars on their course, on an orbit around the sun. And, and in that, he gave us seasons. He gave us times where weather would change. He, he, he gave the, 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 I think of like the life cycle of a pine tree, how even right now, as we're looking at these forest fires, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. But there's a system of sustainability that he created when he spoke out all the vegetation out of his mouth. That he, he spoke it and by the word of his power, it went forward and all these forests were planted. And now even when they burn, the, the lodgepole pine has this pine cone that only opens up when it's, when it's under this immense heat that's usually only found in a fire. And so even in the time of this, it's just so destructive, so chaotic. We can see the beauty of our creator that he said, no, it's not going to be the way it ends. That's going to be the way that it, that it gives birth to new life. And forests are going to regrow and they're going to be clean and they're going to be cleansed. and They're going to be beautiful. And so he's creating these systems. He's creating your digestive systems. He's creating the way that metabolism works. He's creating all of these different things at the moment of creation. So he's not just our creator in the sense that he made the things. He made the way the things work. He's set them on their course. And, and really, what, what Genesis 1 is all going to culminate towards is it's going to point us towards the creation of man and woman. There's, there's this pattern set up in Scripture. And, and anytime there's a pattern set up, you need, to, you need to pay attention to when that pattern is broken. And so God creates, and for, for five days straight, he creates all the different things that we find ourselves immersed in in this universe. And then he says, after each one, and it was good, and it was good. And I created the stars in the sky, the, the expanse in the, in the vast chasm of space. He put stars in the sky, and it was good. And I, and I gave all this life on the earth, and it was good. And then he created man and woman. And he says it was very good. And so right off the bat, you, you see in Genesis that we are actually, as human beings, the pinnacle of God's creation. We're the thing that he looks at us and he says, That's, that, was, that was very good. What I just made there was awesome. And, and I, you don't ever get the sense of a struggle when God's creating things. Like I think of in my own creative effort at times when I've tried to help with a project for my kids at school. And there's a, definitely an element in my creativity where I try and it looks okay. And then, so, so I try again. It's a little harder. You don't get that sense with God. Like he just, he just, opens his mouth. He just speaks it and it obeys. He, th there's such immense power behind his creativity that's, that's shocking, really. And, and what we'll see now in, in Genesis, as we read through chapter one and we get ourselves to verses 28 and 29, we'll see that God has intended for now us to go forth and bear his image to the world. And so it says in verse 28 of Genesis chapter one, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And he's given us all the beasts of the field, and he's given us everything to, to really lord over in his power first. He's given us then, he's, he's entrusted with us this earth that he's made, and he's called us to go in Genesis 2. He would say, and now, now work the ground and care for it, cultivate the earth. And so it, it, this is what theologians would call the creation mandate, that out of God's creative nature, human, human beings would go out and they would, they would fulfill this mandate entrusted to them to go and to cultivate and have dominion over the world that you now find yourself in. And I think this text has been used poorly at times to say that, well, the earth is just ours for our benefit or for our prosperity. And so we can just use it and we can, we can just have our dominion like exercised violently over different parts of the earth or over different species of animals. But what I think this really points to, especially when you couple it with all of scripture, is that no, we would actually cultivate the land. That we would, that we in the same way God would put his hands on and use us and, and form us up for, for his glory, that we would actually put our hands in the dirt, that we would put our hands into business into our homes, and that we would build something, steward something, create something out of the resources that he's given us for, for the beauty of our world and for his glory. And so really, 
as, as we begin to jump into this, I, I have two main hopes for this series. M- my first hope is that we would all actually take our, take our mind off of the left brain, right brain, I am creative, I'm not creative kind of conversation that we find ourselves in in 2020. And we would actually move our minds over to this, this reality that God has actually given all of us this spirit of creativity. He's given all of us giftedness. He's uniquely wired each of us to solve problems, to fix things, to innovate, to get better. Like, have you ever thought for a second that, that really this is a huge thing that we have difference, uh, indifference towards animals? Like your dog is not sitting at home wondering if he can create a more sustainable living structure for all of the dogs on planet Earth. But we are like humans are like, man, this, this isn't working this way. And so we try and refine and we try and innovate like political systems and education systems. And we're always trying to improve and push the ball forward. We, we take these, we take these like hills and we turn them into these organized uh, crop yielding farmlands. We, we take, we take houses and we make them homes. Like we, we don't just live somewhere for safety and for security, but we actually have somewhere where there's, where there's like the ability to have intimacy with a family where we can love each other and we can bring up our kids in a way that's safe and beautiful and rich and meaningful and significant. Like we're different. We as humans are different. We, we have this desire. Every person, this is not just reserved for the Christian, but every single person has the capacity, has the ability to be creative and to build and to cultivate and to steward things. And that's a charge given explicitly to us as humans. And so my hope is that in this series, we would all see that and that more specifically, we as Christians would see then our unique ability to partner with the creator in creating things here on planet earth. And so yes, everyone's been given the creation mandate, but now as Christians, we actually get to participate and we would say that we have a relationship with a God who is creative. And so just as much as we would talk about uh, his nature coming out through of us, like we hope that God's love is coming out of us in the way that we live in the world. We hope that we're living in relationship close enough so that we start to look like him. So we start to love people like he loved people and that we would like see reconciliation happen, that we would infuse hope into situations. Those are all parts of his character that I think we talk about often, but I think one of them that we maybe don't talk about as much is that he is creative. He creates things. And so we get to be creative in our problem solving. We get to, we get to take the things that he's made out of nothing and we get to turn them into something that glorifies God. And so I hope we all get to see that. I hope we get to all get kind of invited into that conversation this way. But I also hope more specifically, even my second hope for this series would be that we as a church can, can create kind of a path or we can create an on-ramp for people who are more classically creative. Like you love art, you love photography, you love making videos, you love storytelling. And I hope that we can create an on-ramp so that you can see how that you aren't wired that way on accident. And you're not, sometimes I think we create this conversation like, well, this type person is better than this type person. And because the artist is so chaotic and maybe we have this kind of poor artist mentality that we think less of them at some times. But what I want to say is that no, God has wired you that way. God has created you that way so that you could use those gifts that he's given you to steward them for the glory of God and for the betterment of our world. And so I hope that we, we, we just did some kind of, not really restructuring, but Steph Hewittson has always been our administrative specialist I, for years and years and years. And this year we just finally said, you know, hey, no, Steph, you're going to be the creative director because that's actually what you've been doing for a long time. You've been, you've been creatively shaping and, and making all the art and all the graphics that you see and making all the videos that you see. She just does this excellent job, but she does it pretty much on her own which is amazing. And so what we want to do is we want to see people in our congregation say, no, I I can tell stories. I can make videos. I can take pictures. I can write captions on Instagram. I can do those things. And we're not going to use them simply for ourselves, but for the glory of God's kingdom, for the advancement of the kingdom, for the spreading of his good news. And so while I hope that we can do two things, bring people, bring everyone into this conversation, but I also hope that specifically for those of you who are more classically creative or more stereotypically creative, I hope that we can show you and we can put you into some places to serve here in the church. And so um, the creation mandate, 
that's where we're kind of jumping in here in scripture. We're looking at the creation mandate, and honestly, we're going to be looking at it for several weeks. And this week is going to be more of a, a setup message for more weeks to come. But I think there's a really plain and simple question that's available for you in scripture today. Um, the creation mandate comes up in several different iterations, and we'll look at more of them. There's, there's one in Jeremiah. That's where there's one spoken to Moses. There's one that Jesus speaks in the Great Commission. We'll talk about how I think actually that's the fulfillment of the creation mandate. It's not a setup separate thing. And so we'll get into all that. But for today, what I hope to just convince you of and show you is that, man, no, like God is creative. God is creative and he created you in his image. I, I was reading Job this week and getting ready for this message. And really it's a, it's a brutal story, but in it, God answers Job at one moment. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he goes into all of this list and he starts to say, do you know where the storehouses of snow are? Do you know where the storehouses of hail are? Are you the one who put the ocean in its place and gave it borders? Like he just speaks and all this stuff. And then he starts talking about dinosaurs. You can read about it if you want in Job chapter 41, but it's just crazy. Clearly God created all of it. And now he has entrusted you with his image which simply just means his nature, his thumbprint is on your soul, which is why you, unlike any animal or any other creative thing, longs to be like him. You recognize something has been lost. And I think that's why, um, that's why we dream. That's why we, that's why we will have uh, an imagination. Because in all of that, we have faith that the future can look better than the past. And I think what that ultimately boils down to is, is our raw humanity that recognizes we lost something in the garden and we're longing to put something back together again one day. That, that's in every single one of us, that we have this imagination, we have this dream for what tomorrow could look like and we're trying to improve things. We're trying to drive ourselves there. We're trying to be better than the generation before us. We're trying to, be, we're trying to build on what they have done. We're not trying to fall into the same patterns that maybe your parents fell into. You're, you don't, you're not just settling for what your company can do, what your business can do, but we're longing to push the ball forward because we were made in God's image and we recognized that after the garden, there was this fracture. There was this sin that entered into the world and broke everything. And now we're trying to piece it back together because our souls long to get back to that day. And we will one day once Jesus comes back. But for now, we're kind of stuck in the cycle of building. We're stuck in the cycle of building. And, and so... I want to look at two stories. One's found here in Genesis and one's found in Exodus. And both of them talk about people coming together to build something. Two kinds of people that are, that are going to be using different resources, using different materials to build something. To, and I would say they're just, they're just being humans. They're being true to their nature, made in the image of God, creating something. Like, like the question before us today is not, were you made to be creative? I think we've settled that. The, the real question to be answered today is, okay, we were all made to be creative in some way. We were all long to cultivate, to steward, to build, to, to use the giftedness in us um, to make something. The real question is, how are you going to then use those gifts that you've been given? How are you going to use them? Are you going to use them for yourself ultimately, or are you going to use them for God's glory? So the first one that we see is the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. So you can open there now, and I'm just going to read this story to you. It's always been a little bit of a strange story to me. Like, does God hate teamwork, or like, what does this story mean? And I hope we'll maybe see some, uh, maybe a little more clarity for some of you who haven't heard this story or don't really understand why God has to come down and confuse all these languages. So Genesis chapter 11 reads like this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And then he, and then he, he does. He confuses their language. He, he recognizes that this is not going to be good. And at first read, you can maybe see one of the glaring issues of the Tower of Babel. It says right there that they, they weren't building the tower for the glory of God. They weren't using their giftedness, their creativity, their, their desire to cultivate. They were using it to make a city. And in the middle, they were going to build a tower that they wanted to stretch all the way up to the heavens 
not so that they could be in contact with God, not so that they could be walking in his presence so they could, they could have a relationship with him. They built it so that they would, so they would have a name for themselves. And I love the, the, the sly like knock that God has where they build this tower, they build this huge old thing. And then it says that, and God came down from heaven. So we, in our best effort, we try to make this tower that goes all the way up to heaven so we can reach him. And God says, oh my gosh, you know what? I don't even know that I can see it from how far away I am from you right now. So let me come all the way down there just so I can observe what you've built. And I know that God could have seen it from heaven. I'm just saying there's, there's a statement that's made there that God still has to come down even after man's best efforts to build its way up to him. And so the first sin of Babel is that of human pride. And I think we all battle this in one form or another, but we all are going to try and use our gifts to build something to make a name for ourselves. And so you think of, I think of like social media, social media on itself is, is just, it's just a thing. It's not good. It's not evil. Just as if the brick, the brick, the stones that they made here to make Babel are not good. They're not evil. It's what you use them for. And so absolutely you could, you could build up a, a following on social media. You could build up a platform on social media. It, it just is a question of what are you using that for? Are you using it so that you can make a name for yourself or are you using it to give glory to God ultimately? The business that you're building right now, the job that you're working in right now, the money that you have in your bank account, none of it by itself is evil. The question though is where it becomes idolatry is when you use the things that God has given you, you use the resources, you use the money, you use the home to build up this thing that all it does is point back to you. And that's the first sin of Babel that they're doing everything. They're using their gifts. They're using their creativity to build something so that people would say, ultimately, hey, look at me. Look what I've done. Isn't this impressive? Aren't I impressive? Aren't I cool? And you see how this sin is not gone from Babel. Even though we all speak in different languages now, every single one of us still will speak in the language of human pride from time to time. And we build up our own kingdom. We build up our own things using the resources God has given us. And, and God opposes it. He confuses it. He says, this is not the way that it should be. And so we can't use our creativity to serve ourselves. But then the other more subtle sin, I think, of Babel is that uh, what they're doing is they're neglecting the mandate to go into the world and to cultivate it. And so this one's a little more subtle because what you, what you realize when you read kind of in between the lines of the story is what God has spoken in Genesis 1 to Adam and Eve is he says, go into the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the whole earth. His call, his charge, especially after they are kicked out of the garden because of sin is still to go and multiply and fill the whole earth and subdue it. And what we've done with Babel is they've come in and they've made a city. And they found for themselves protection. They found for themselves security. They found for themselves comfort. The city, the city walls, they represent comfort. They represent safety. And, and so the second sin of Babel is this neglecting the mandate to go. And they come in and they use their resources to just pull into this one place where God has given you resources to go out into the world, go out into the world and to cultivate it, to fill the earth and subdue it. And so we cannot stay. We cannot get comfortable. We cannot let our giftedness or our resources drive us to comfort, but they always need to lead us towards this, this uh, discontentment for the way that the world is, for this care for my neighbor, for this awareness of the things that my coworkers, my friends are going through. It's not just to build up me and my house. It's for me to go out into the world and make a difference with the things that he's given to me. And so this is how we would use our money. This is how we would use our talents. Our, I think of people who have the spiritual gift of hospitality. How, how at, at the most self-serving way you could view that is like, I'm going to make a beautiful home just for me and just for my family. Where, where actually what Jesus wants to do, if you have the spiritual gift of hospitality, you have this ability to create a beautiful space where people feel welcome and people feel loved. And that just I've seen so many people where they use that in a way that just pulls different people in and they go, no, come here, take refuge. Let me tell you something that I've learned about Jesus. And we've create, we, we can take it, we can pervert it, we can use it for ourselves, we can use it for our own security, or we can turn it and we can unleash it for the kingdom of God. And so that is the Tower of Babel. Those are the problems with Babel. But then there's another story. There's a story about a tent. There's a story about a tabernacle. We flip on over to Exodus 31, where we'll read about this guy, 
Bezalel. Exodus 31 verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel. He was called. He's the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him. So he was called and he was filled with the Spirit of God. He's been filled with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. So here you have this guy that, that God has called now to make the tabernacle. He's going to fashion. He's going to put all of it together according to some very specific guidelines. Because what the tabernacle is, if you remember, it, it happens right after God has entered into a covenant relationship with his people. So he's rescued him out of Egypt. He's brought him through the wilderness to this place called Mount Sinai. He takes Moses up to the top of the mountain. He makes this law. And with it, he writes him on these stone tablets signifying that he is now entering into a covenant relationship with his people. It's this treaty, if you will, between God and man. And they're going to do these things. And one of the things that is the uh, uh, reoccurring theme through scripture is that God wants to be with them. God wants to be with you. God wants to be with us. And so he creates this design for a tabernacle. It's a portable church, if you think about it. They didn't have a building yet. Israel didn't have the temple yet. But they have, while they're wandering through the wilderness, this place where the presence of God can fill this place up and they can encounter him. And, and so Bezalel is equipped, he's gifted, he's filled with the Spirit of God in doing so, and he builds this thing, he teaches other people with him, he brings people along, and they build this beautifully perfect tabernacle. And with that, the Spirit of God is back. He has re- the Spirit of God, uh, the presence of God has returned to be with his people. And so I, I think there's a few things that you got to note from this is that, is that Bezalel, he, he didn't do this under his own might. He was filled with the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God came, the Spirit of God brought with it a giftedness, a, a likeness to God's creative nature into him, into a man, into a person. And with that, he was actually able to build something that he didn't use. If you, if you look at it counter to the story of Babel, he didn't use it for his own glory. It, maybe, maybe you haven't even heard that guy's name before as we've talked through scripture, but he's this guy who was filled with the Spirit of God to do something to bring other people into the presence of God. So he was called and filled with the Spirit. He was gifted uniquely for a specific thing to do. Nobody else was given the charge of making all the things of the tabernacle. Bezalel was and his, and his people. Other people were called to do different things. He was given a unique charge, a unique call. And that unique call was to bring people into the presence of God. Now, here's where I just have to land this for this morning is that you, you have been called by God. There is no longer a, a temple in the sense of a place where we literally go to to encounter God's presence. Like, like we don't view church as this like we're going to all gather and then we're all actually going to fly on over to Jerusalem where we're going to go to the temple and we're going to encounter the presence of God. That's not how it works. Because now that Jesus has come, now that he has paid the price for our sins, rose from the cross, ascended to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit so that now your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. So now your body, your, you are the place that God inhabits and he puts his presence in you. And when that happens, when you're a believer and you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus and you're going, okay, not my will, God, but your way, I'm going to follow you. You are the Lord of my life. When you make that decision, when you make that commitment, now the spirit of God all of a sudden opens up. He doesn't, he doesn't remake the gifts, but he, he, he redeems the giftedness that's in you. So that now it does no longer, it no longer just serves you or serves your people, but it actually now serves the kingdom of God. So he's gifted you. And the reason he's gifted you is for that very reason. So that you can see other people come into the presence of Jesus. He's, he's gifted you creatively. He's given you something. He's given you resources. It's not just that you're this artist or painter. And my hope in this series is not that you would pick up painting. My hope in this series is that you would see the spiritual gifts that God has put inside of you. You would see the resources that he's put into your hand, the money that he's given you, the business that he's placed you in, the home of, of, for the little children that you're now homeschooling. God has called you to that. He's placed you in that. And you're going to have to solve problems creatively almost every day in homeschooling. I just guarantee it. 
Like we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to solve, like we're gonna have to have creative conversations with people in our workplace so that we can diffuse tensions, so that we can repair and restore relationships. Like there's all kinds of ways that we are going, as a people, going to need to enter into places with creativity. Most things in life are not simple. Most things in life are not easy. In fact, I think the most worthwhile things that, are do, that we do are complex and they're difficult and they require us to think outside of the box, think beyond ourselves, but with the spirit of God, having discernment in a situation, having a giftedness for a situation, we would step in and that we would cultivate the earth, cultivate our friendships, cultivate every place that we would find ourselves in for the glory of God and for his presence to fill the people around us. That's the redeeming story of the tent. It's contrary to the tower. The tower tells us all about how we will like to serve ourselves. But when we look at the tent, when we look at Bezalel, when we look at what the spirit of God does in a person, we see that it is all pointing us to God's glory, to using the things that he's given us for his advancement so that we can take his good news and fill the earth with it. I think there's a lot of emotions or a lot of feelings that you see biblical characters having all throughout scripture. You see people um, who are following Jesus, who are depressed, who are anguishing. You see people who are grieving, who are lamenting. You see people who are joy filled. You see people who are frustrated, but what you don't see in the Bible are biblical characters who are bored. They're not bored. And if you're bored today, if your faith is boring to you, I would say you, you lack to see the full picture of the creation mandate that God has entrusted you with. God has equipped you specifically to go out and make a difference in this specific moment in time. God knew you were going to be walking in coronavirus. God knew that you were going to be walking through all the racial tension of 2020, through all this like just political divisiveness that we find ourselves in. He's called and he's placed you here specifically. He's put, this, he's put specific people in your life around you right now. And our tendency is to get comfortable and to build ourselves up into this safe place and to stay. But our call, our charge is to go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go, take the presence of God with you and see to it that other people are filled with that very same transformational presence. That's our charge. That's our hope. And so we're going to talk a little bit more next week about how we would actually go about doing that, how we would go and live out, live this out in the world we live in. But for now, what I want you to see is that you were created for far more than just existing, disappearing, and never making a difference. You were created to actually not be bored in this life, but to be getting involved in the tough spaces, using the creative gifts given you by God to go out and to see that his presence would fill people. So would you pray with me? Jesus, we love you and we're going to need you in every step of this way, Lord. And so I pray that you would be filling people up even right now with inspiration, with, with imagination to go and, and to see the way that the world could be around them. Would they not settle for the way that relationship is right now? Would they not settle for the way their home is right now? But would they see, um, not with the spirit of discontentment, God, but with the spirit of hope, would they be filled to see the world in the way that you see it and to go out and to be participating with you as you restore and redeem and renew all things? We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.